Hey, Ravi. Thank you very much for coming on the Coffee and Pens podcast. Let's start with a small introduction of yourself. Hey, Kiel. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Ravi Jagopal. I have been an entrepreneur for over 25 years. I started selling in 1997 and I've sold pretty much everything you can imagine online, um, ebooks, physical books, courses, WordPress plugins, downloadable software, t-shirts, tchotchkes, agency services, coaching. So I have uh, been doing this for a while and I have learned a lot seeing the different trends. I was one of the earliest uh, adopters of WordPress and um, and I created my, my first blog post somewhere in like 2002, 2003, I believe. And uh, I've been using WordPress ever since. I wrote a plugin back then, um, a simple contact us form plugin. And that was my first uh, test plugin. And then ever since I've been using and uh, creating plugins for WordPress. And that's uh, pretty much uh, WordPress is the core of my, my business. Uh-huh. So you said you have sold um, almost everything. What's the favorite thing you've sold online? The easiest one to sell, of course, has been a, a Kindle book, uh-huh. you know, digital ebooks. So Kindle has made it so much easier. In the, in the past, uh, you could you had to you could still do it quickly. You could create still create a PDF fast, but there was no international marketplace where you could uh, distribute it. Mm-hmm. There was no, no other platform that had the reach that uh, Amazon Kindle has, right? So that's been amazing. Um, even though my latest book, I didn't launch it on Kindle. I launched it on my own website, uh-huh. but but uh, Kindle is still amazing and uh, uh, creating digital products is always fun. And so books, and because my superpower is writing and I ha- I'm really fast at typing like 105 words per minute, so I can churn out content really, really fast. So writing books is, is a major strength for me. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm also a super passionate programmer, um, developer. So I, you know, WordPress plugins and scripts and stuff like that, which is what got me started PHP scripts. But uh, I'm slowly moving away from that um, because there's a lot of support and everything involved. So I want to go, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing more of the um, coaching and consulting to small businesses and corporate clients and, uh, and my podcast. So I'm moving into more, more into that, not moving into, I'm already moved into that space now. Okay. Um, and a different question about your products. What do you think is the funniest product that you've sold online? The funniest? Yeah. Well, I, I did create a, a baby names ebook. Uh, that was my first uh, attempt at a digital product. And it had a, I made, made sure to include all kinds of different uh, um, stories and funny stories and all kinds of, so that's probably in terms of me being able to uh, make somebody laugh. Uh, that was probably one of the things. And then in every one of my books, I try to include humor. So I'm always trying to tell stories. Um, I don't know if you get a chance to go through my book, but uh, sure. there's there's some stories and I try to, you know, try to keep it lighthearted and uh, yep. tell a lot of things from my past and then finally tie it back into the main topic, which is digital marketing. Mm-hmm. So you, you mentioned that your latest book, you've launched that on your website, not on Amazon. Is this about um, Dogpoo and Dosa? Yes, correct. Dogpoo and Dosa. Okay, but then you did put it on Amazon later on. I did publish it on Amazon the same day, but I have not promoted it at all. Uh, okay, okay, that makes sense. So I don't, I don't, I haven't linked it. I haven't sent a link out to my email list. Nothing. Mm-hmm. It's just there, and somebody happened to find find it organically. I have not even opted into KDP Select, so Amazon probably is doing zero promotion for it, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not, you know, getting any traffic because. Uh, there's no KDP select. That means my, I'm, I'm not opted into the Kindle Unlimited program. Okay. So I'm, uh, I don't get page views read from there. So that I just published it on Amazon for kind of like a copyright reasons. You know, okay. I, don't want, I don't want to just publish it on, on only my website and then somebody takes it and publishes it on Amazon first mm-hmm. and then I have to go through a legal battle. I don't, I don't want yeah. all the hassle. So straight away, same day, I published it on Kindle and, and that same day I launched it to my list um, and ever since I only promoted to my to my website to my okay. list. What has been the main uh, like driving factor behind this decision to launch it on your website and no longer on Amazon? Because I wanted to create a funnel. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past, I've sold, I've, I've launched my last, probably all of my books directly on okay. uh, on Amazon. My very first book was in two thousand and seven, I think. Uh, back then there was no Kindle, so I had to, I created a physical book and published it, and it. It, it did uh, go to a cat, you know, it did become a category bestseller at the point in the um, digital marketing, something related space. So that was good. 
but uh, and every other all pretty much everything else all other the next six uh, are all ebooks uh, and i publish all of them directly on amazon and sometimes I i've tried all kinds of different types of launches and one of them was you know launching it for 99 cents only to my list first for the first few days hey go buy uh, it, it's at the lowest price now right and it gives them a reason to go buy it within the next three days and then you raise the price by then hopefully they have driven a lot of sales and you get you know you get to take a bunch of screenshots vanity metrics mm-hmm. screenshots to yeah. say oh I'm, look i'm the kindle category bestseller for this one for the seven straight days or whatever right um yeah. so i tried out different kinds of approaches and uh, this time i said you know i'm going to do a full-fledged uh, uh, launch i could have done even better but uh, i wanted to have a full funnel you know my own sales page with the control of uh, having control over the entire look and feel of the landing page mm-hmm. the the different headline and subheadline, being able to tell a story and control the landing page, the uh, and then have your own pricing table, three different options: ebook only, ebook and audiobook, and then audiobook only, and then offer a bunch of bonuses mm-hmm. and have a timer. So basically, all the elements of a typical offer, right? Yeah. The, so the offer is not just the product, but it is a culmination of the landing page, the the landing page elements, the top, the headline, subheadline, the video at the top. Um, and then the the feature, the benefits, and then the features, and the pricing table, the um, deadline, uh, the timer, uh, expiring timer, and you know buy now button, and different t- pricing options. And then I had an upsell for one of my courses, mm-hmm. uh, SEO course, upcoming SEO course. So I sh- I could have had one more upsell, but uh, so that's I wanted to have control over the whole thing, and then add them to my email list, which was most critical thing for me. It was not even about the money um, because you know they take 30% Amazon Kindle, it's not a big deal, but you are basically driving your entire list to go to another platform. Yeah. And Amazon doesn't tell you who bought it, uh-huh. right? So yeah. that's the most frustrating part. Uh, if Amazon only shared the email, then I probably wouldn't have bothered because I, once I have the email, I can still make other offers later on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, th- thank you for purchasing. By the way, next 48 hours uh, or 72 hours, you have this upsell offer you can buy at only, you know, Twenty uh, percent of the price or whatever, yeah. I, I, but I can't do that because they, they don't provide the email, and uh, people generally. I've tried a lot of different tactics to get people to give me their email address. I've always offered a lot of bonuses in my Kindle eBooks. So the first uh, page itself is, you know, after the title and the the introduction, the, the next page is. Um, bonuses available with this Kindle ebook. Okay. And I've offered lots of bonuses, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of bonuses. And all they have to do is just forward the Kindle email from their purchase to my email address, mm-hmm. right? R- Ravi at subscribeme.fm. I put, put the email address in the thing and say, just forward it, just hit forward. You can take out any personal information if you want, just uh, forward it and I'll give you access to this course and this ebook and this blah, blah, blah. Nobody, I literally probably get less than a per- 1% of my buyers. So I tried all kinds of things over the years, split tested Amazon Kindle books, so to speak. And uh, it has not worked uh, very well because you know I, I can't contact them ever again. Uh, it doesn't matter if I make a thousand sales, it's like they're not coming back. I cannot remarket to them. I cannot promote anything else. I cannot tell them to go check out my podcast and build a relationship with them. I cannot send them to my YouTube videos, nothing, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like gone in, into a vacuum, into, yeah. a bla- into a black hole. So when I do a launch on my own website, this was easily my biggest launch in fact, I just uh, talked about, uh, I've been podcasting about this last couple of episodes at my podcast yeah. uh, at subscribeme.fm, the lessons learned from these uh, from this latest launch. And it is that the reason why I had the biggest launch ever, you know, out of the eight books, this was my biggest launch ever. And it beat, you know, many plugin launches in the past as well, because, you know, a culmination of everything, right? Now is, you know, after 25 years of doing this, now is when I have the largest audience I've ever had previously. Uh-huh. Right. And, you know, one year from now, that'll be my biggest audience because I'm constantly going to keep growing my audience. But so far right now is the, is my best, the the biggest audience I've ever had. This is one of my best books that I've written. It's like almost 320, 350, almost 350 pages, uh, put all all of my 25 years of learning and experience and uh, uh, lessons and everything else into this ebook. Mm -hmm. And, and I got to control the offer, got to make up one click upsells. After the purchase, or whether they bought the ebook or the audiobook or both, uh, there was a one uh, immediate upsell offer for my course. So that's a one-click thing. They all just have to click yes or or no. I don't want it. They're straight away taken to the members area. They can download the ebook right there, the PDF, and they are now on my list. 
then on the landing page of the thank you page, I have embedded my podcast player, uh, the playlist, so they can check it out. So I got a bunch of uh, podcast uh, listens from that. Mm -hmm. So basically able to promote my own brand and not be in the dark entirely about what the heck happened with my book sales other than I got a thousand sales and nothing else. Yeah, perfect. So this is all about Dogbu and, and Dosa, your latest book. I'm curious about the title. So I went through your eight books and book one to six or seven, their titles are informative. This is exactly what you'll get, like what you'll learn from this book. Now, when I see the title Dogbu and Dosa, I have no idea. So it's a clever title, not an informative one. Where did Correct. you make the change? Correct. So it was meant as a curiosity inducing title, right? Pattern interrupt they call it an nlp so you're usually going through books you know 20 best ways to do this what are the blah 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 or you know uh seven habits of highly effective people blah blah, blah. so you yeah. look at dog poo and those are like what there is a double take um pattern interrupt element to that but you're not remember you're uh, when you're looking at a book on amazon you're not looking at just the title right mm -hmm. you also get to look at the uh, thumbnail image and on the thumbnail image, I made sure that it is very clear what those two words are. And there is a graphic that shows yeah. the visual element of what DOCPU and DOSA is. So for your listeners, DOCPU is an acronym for uh, do once, get paid only once. And DOSA, D-O-S-A-A, -A, is an acronym for do once, sell again and again. So you'll see the, if you go to uh, dogpoobook.com, you'll see the, the nice book cover. I got somebody to design for me. And uh, <clears throat> it, it not only explains what those two words are, but there's also a visual element um, that shows, you know, there's one dot leading to one point, which is dog poo. You do once, get paid only, which leads to the dollar, right? And then there's the other ways like all over the place. So there's the dot in the middle and there's arrows going all over, which means do once, get paid over, do once, sell again and again. So that was the key. So I was counting on initially, you know, if somebody didn't understand what dog poo means and if they think it's, oh, it's stinky, it's nasty, even if they do that before they can make up their mind, uh, they are looking at the full image and it clearly mentions what it is. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't, you know, probably maybe there'll be, there'll always be, in fact, uh, when I approached a whole bunch of people, including you on Twitter, I DM'd a, a, a few, uh, you know, niche leaders and one person outright said, I will never read a book that has the word dog poo in the title. So, well, it's fine. You know, uh -huh. I explained, I explained to him what it is. I told him it's not about dog poo, right? <laughs> so, but some people, they, they cannot get the image out of their head. That's fine. But uh -huh. for 99.999% of the people, I've had nothing but uh, like you just said, you know, you didn't say it's a horrible title. You said it's interesting title. So that's the feedback I got from a lot of people, everybody uh, I approached, even people, uh, strangers online who I had no relationship with said when I offered them, hey, I have written this book called Dark Poo and Dosa. And when I paste the link in DMs, whether on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is, the OG tags, it picks up the image, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the message. So there you can see Dark Poo, do once, get paid only once, Dosa, right? So they yeah. can see right away, it's not really, I'm not talking about dog doo-doo, mm -hmm. really. Uh, and so people, oh, that's, that's interesting. That's uh, that's a very interesting title. So that's what uh, the most feedback I got. But you know, if, if somebody doesn't like it, you know, well, that's fine. Right. But I do get the benefit of of it being an interesting title, and I I think more people will check it out rather than get offended or disgusted. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So over to writing. You've written eight books right now. I think you've developed your process through those books. So say you're going to start writing book number nine. Where do you start? Where do you think you'll finish? So assuming that I already have an idea about what the, the content is going to be, right? So I'm not going to just sit down one day and say, what should I write about next, right? For mm -hmm. me, it has to happen organically. Yep. And over time, over you know weeks and months, I'm getting all these different ideas and I make sure I don't lose any idea ever. Um, however small it may seem at the time, I, I put it on my Wonderlist, which is a formerly Wonderlist, now mm -hmm. called Microsoft To Do. So I put it there, I have thousands of entries in different folders, I've organized it pretty well. So when I have a text, I have a folder called ideas and whatever ideas I get, I put it in there. I don't worry about whether it's a book idea or a video idea or a blog post idea. I just, if I'm running or out on the street somewhere and as long as I'm not driving, I can pull out my phone and put a uh, note the idea down. And over a period of time, I'll notice a pattern em emerging, right? Okay. And I'll see something in the, like one of the books I wrote was, is called Crush It with Kindle. 
And that yeah. is because I had gotten to the point where I had mastered kind of the process, right? So I wanted to put all that in there. So that whatever you see there, uh, I'm happy to give you a free copy of that. Uh, just remind me uh, later. Thank you. And um, that shows the whole process of how I do brainstorming, how I make a note of all the things. And I start with the table of contents always uh, before I do before I go deep, obviously I don't have to have 100% of the table of contents ready, mm -hmm. but if, if I have like 10 things I want to talk, talk about, right? Um, for example, if I were to write, if I decided that, you know what, uh, I've been writing so many Kindle books, I should write a book about it. And then the first thing I'll do is I'll open a mind map. Uh, mind map is, I find it the fastest way to brainstorm. And once you have the, put the main bubble uh, the core uh, topic of the mind map is a Kindle book, right? Then if you had hit a tab, it goes one level deeper. If you hit enter, it goes to the next uh, same level. Yeah. So all I have to do is, is hit tab. Then first first chapter, I'll just make it up, right? How to format, what to, tools to use to write a Kindle book, right? Type it in, enter. Now it's time for the next chapter. And then say, um, what to where to find the book cover, right? So boom, 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 boom. Like within a few minutes, I can just randomly brainstorm seven, yeah. eight, 10 topics. And then now I have the structure, then I can look at each one of them. And then quickly within that, like ebook, uh, like cover design, within that I can have four different, okay, Canva and then 99 designs. And the cool thing about mind map is once you have some something written out, then you can just control A, copy, and you go to notepad or Word. I use Microsoft Word yeah. um, and hit paste. Neat, the whole thing is a text now. Okay. And I can just select all. Make, turn it into H1 uh, for heading and say insert table of contents, boom. Now everything is a chapter. Mm -hmm. And so now I, all I have to do is just go and start creating the content um, for each one of those chapters. And whenever I think of something else, I'll go back and update the table of contents or the other thing, the, the main thing about writing is you can't just make up stuff, right? So yeah. things, sometimes there'll be all these notions that we have in our head that these things we believe but I can't just say it, right? Like say a majority of people use Microsoft Word, right? I might think that, but if I'm going to write it, I have to do some, you know, check, fact right. check. So, so whenever I have those kind of things that I need to check on, whether I need to get a, a number from somewhere, I'll just put XXX in that uh, and just move on to the next paragraph or next chapter. And then later on, it's easier to just do a control F, find all the XXX and then fill it in one by one. Yep. So after having written eight books, what do you think is the, the biggest lesson that you learned? Obviously, you have to have a decent command over the language and uh, you can always get it edited. I don't feel the need to get it edited in, in terms of uh, proofreading and all that kind of stuff is fine if you want to do that. But I feel like I don't want a um, proper book editor changing the tone of my language because okay. I'm very, very comfortable with, uh, with the way I have a conversational tone in, mm -hmm. my, in my writing as well which I've gotten a lot of feedback for that it's very easy to read, fun to read, your, your personality comes through. I love the stories, that kind of stuff. So there'll be some people who, you know, who won't like that, but that's fine. I'm not trying to write for everybody. Uh -huh. and, and my goal is to ultimately filter everybody, right? You can't worry about everybody, but you just keep attracting people who like your style, uh, who don't mind your accent or you know your, the way you look, everything. You keep growing that tribe of people so that you can grow your 1,000 true fans. So I don't worry about that. Um, just type it, type everything, get everything out onto the editor first. Mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about perfectionism. Do not worry about the grammar. Do not worry about does it read well if somebody reads it. The first dump has to be a complete brain dump. Uh -huh. uh, and you just got to type as fast as you can. If you are not a good ty fast typer, just open Google Docs, Microsoft Word, all of them have a transcription uh, tool now. You click the mic, start speaking, and then it'll just type it on the screen. There's like 100 different tools that can do that for free. And just start talking. Doesn't matter the ums and ahs that you come in when you're trying to dictate something. It'll make a note of all that. Do not worry about any of that. Get everything onto the paper first and, and then come back and do it. And then try to come back. You can, there's tools like Grammarly, you can outsource, crowdsource editing. You can get your 100 best uh, you know, sub newsletter subscribers or somebody and you can send it to them and tell them if you find any mistakes, please let me know. They'll be more than happy and it makes them feel vested in your work. Okay. Uh, so I, I guess the biggest lesson is uh, just do it. Just get everything out. Don't, don't strive for perfection. And, and also try to build an audience along the way because mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't have an audience, um, it's going to be harder to launch, but I would still not say that's a, the reason to not write a book. 
Don't wait to build an audience to write the ebook. If you don't have an audience already, you can actually use your ebook to build an audience. Yeah. yeah. You can give it to a lot of people for free. You can build a relationship. You know, in fact, if you think about how we are talking right now, that's because of me offering you a copy. You you very graciously accepted it. You read it. You appreciate it, and you wanted me on the on your podcast, which I really appreciate. You're giving me your time, so I, I want to give back some value. So you can build a lot of great relationships just by giving it to for, to people for free, and you can build a sm- small, powerful network. Yeah, exactly. There's um, some good lessons there. And people always love to learn from challenges as well. What do you think has been your biggest challenge during all these years that you've been writing books? Books specifically have not been a challenge for me because it comes very naturally. But I have had challenges in other areas in terms of building an, a, an audience, right? You're always trying to reach out to more people. Um, I could do a lot better with uh, building a bigger audience. One of the topics I talk about in my book is go deep, uh, then wide which yeah. is to, to go deep into a niche rather than wide. So instead of selling digital marketing products one day about Kindle and the next day you're about cryptocurrency and the very next day about puppy training, the, you, your audiences, there's very little in common between them. So you're going wide, but I have gone deep my whole life, right? It's uh, about digital products and pro- coding and WordPress and podcast is about digital marketing. My books are all about Kindle, how to write a Kindle book, how to write a, how to create a podcast in seven hours and how to promote a podcast and confessions of a wannabe podcaster. So everything is related to digital marketers. And because of that, I have been able to snowball my audience over time. You know, every time I do a launch there and my next product is going to be in the same niche. So I can, I can send an email to the same people and not worry about building a fresh new audience. But you know, my biggest challenges have been whenever I try to go f- the first of anything I did. The first time I wrote a book, I didn't have a, much of an audience for that book. Yeah. Right? But the, se- the second book, I had a decent audience and so on. And but again, one of the reasons I, I probably would have had a bigger audience if I had published on my own bo- uh, website first. So seven of those I launched on Kindle uh-huh. and uh, 99%, I don't know who, who, who the heck bought it, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. 1% who sent me forwarded me the Kindle email for the bonuses or something. I have built a relationship with them, but I don't know any of the other people, which is a huge missed opportunity for me. And the same thing when it comes to launching a plugin, you need to network and constantly be trying to build relationship. And obviously I could have done a so much better job over the years, but you have to do what you can. And um, because I had to overcome a, a full-time job and I had to get my green card and then get my citizenship. So there's all, all these other challenges as well. Yeah. Um, and having a full-time job and working, you know, in a job that is very, very stressful, working 60, 65 hours a week. And then now you have family to take care of the house and shoveling snow and <laughs> taking <laughs> the, kid, the kids to uh, ballet class and uh, <laughs> basketball classes. And, uh, and then now you have to, work nights and weekends, you know, where are you going to work, can't get enough sleep. So all those things uh, I had to overcome and like anybody else, you know, not, nothing special, but uh, those are, I think uh, I would consider some of my biggest challenges. Yeah. Yeah. I can definitely relate to that. And what have you found to be the best solution to overcome that, that challenge, especially of building your audience? Of specifically building your audience, you just have to spend more time giving value on, on different platforms. And one of the things you can do is repurpose your content, which works to some extent. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can repurpose the ideas, not, not too much. You cannot really repurpose too much of the same content because if I take my TikTok video, which is like 15 seconds long and put it on YouTube, nobody's going to watch it, right? Yeah. So you, you cannot do a one-to-one repurposing of your content, but you start with where your audience is the most, right? So you could start with writing a blog post because writing is a lot easier than any other format at least for most people, right? Because you can you can write it in different times. So you mm-hmm. can write it one hour in the afternoon, one hour in the in evening, one hour next day. You cannot do a single video split no. into that, that many pieces because you look different, your clothes are different. You cannot wear the same cloth every time, you know? And so there's a lot of challenges to that, but you can write over multiple days. You can have somebody else look at the editing and uh, edit the copy for you. You can do a lot of different things. So right, I would say start with the writing first, then you can take that writing and then you read it out you add some natural, you know, you can 
you take the script, but you don't have to read it word for word like a audio book. Mm-hmm. But you can just take the take the general idea and you can riff and you can go off tangents and make it very natural. And even reading from a script and making natural requires practice, right? That's why you see news anchors on television or literally every movie and every video show, they're all scripted. Yeah. But the, audience, the actors are not just reading off of a script. They're uh-huh. taking that, memorizing it and adding character and acting and emotion to it, right? You can do the same thing with a, a written script of your content and you yeah. can turn it, turn it into, you can do video, you can put your, yourself on camera, uh, you can record it and then add slides in between uh, here and there. You can add uh, different kinds of things. Um, you can t- create a video out of it, video presentation, you, then you upload it to YouTube, then you take the audio, it becomes a podcast. Then you take the general idea and a few of the hooks, the main title, uh, some of the best parts of your things. You can create a Twitter thread out of it and uh, you can then take a little pieces, create a TikTok. So there's so many things you can do to uh, repurpose your content. And I would say one-on-one content repurposing is not possible, but you do have to put some effort into uh, creating different uh, pieces of content for different mm-hmm. platforms, yeah. uh, for, but it is worth it. And in the beginning, when you don't have an audience, uh, you have to put the time in because you never know where your audience is. That's one of the challenges of uh-huh. when you're new, you don't know where your next uh, true fan is, 1,000 true fan is going to come from. And that's all you want. You eventually want to get to your 1,000 true fans. That should be your goal of attracting your 1,000 true fans who will buy practically anything you publish. Mm-hmm. And that will allow you to, that is why Kevin Kelly at kk.org, right, wrote that, uh, came up with a brilliant piece, which okay. I, I love and follow. And I even created a course about it, 1001 True Fans, okay. uh, about how to implement all that repurposing and everything else to create, a, to build your audience. And so you have to start with, you know, there's the evolution of your fans. So it starts with somebody who just came across your content, could be a reader, and then they they maybe follow you, then they become a follower, right? They hit the follow mm-hmm. button, then they sign up for your email list. Then at some point, hopefully they become a customer and yeah. then they become your 1000 true fan. So you, you have to start at the bottom. You cannot directly access your 1000 true fan because they have to go through that um, process before they know that you are the guy that or a girl that they need to follow. And that because everything you say makes sense to them and they can identify with, with you, with what you're saying, they also felt that and they can, uh-huh. um, they can feel your advice, right? So, yeah. so, so for going through that process, you have to get to a much wider audience first because you know, only a certain percentage, it's the law of diminishing returns. If you, if a thousand people look at your post, maybe you know, 100 people will follow you. Out of the hundred people, maybe fifty people, you know, become email subscriber. Thirty people become a fan and, and customer, and then so it's always diminishing. Mm-hmm. So the more more people you can reach, the the greater the it's basically a numbers game at that point. And yeah. always you're always trying to see, okay, how can I add more value? How can I reach more people and spread my message to the most number of people so that I can get more people to know, like, and trust along this journey with me? But it's not just about the numbers or making money. It is about, you have to have that, why am I doing this? You know, when you were asking earlier, what is one of the ways you get, got past the challenges? Yeah. It is knowing like uh, Simon Sinek says, you know, start with why. Knowing your why, it helps you. Because if, you, if your only goal is, I want to make a lot of money, then there's so many different ways to do that. And if you pick the wrong type of making money, uh-huh. you'll probably fail. And, or it'll take a lot longer to succeed and you'll get bored. And, and you will get uh, discouraged along the way. But when you know what you want to do and when you have an idea of how you want to do it, then you can overcome a lot of the different challenges and frustrations and obstacles because uh, it's not just about making money. It's not just about fame. It's about the journey and you understand that and you're able to get past all, all the different uh, hardships that come your way. All right, thank you. That was very insightful. Let's um, move into a few shorter questions. Uh, a few interesting facts I found in your book on Amazon. So one of those is that you say your father was a very gifted poet and writer in India. What, what did you learn from him specifically about writing? Uh, unfortunately, his writings were in a different language, non-English language. Okay. So I couldn't translate the, you know, the actual skill because yeah. his skill, I did not get his skill of, you know, writing poetry, right? He was an unbelievably creative person who could come out with such romantic songs. You know, it's like Ed Sheeran, right? 
<laughs> I know English, he knows English. But we are, the kind of words we can come up with for a song are now no comparison, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just because we know the same language, uh, or even if I had known the same language, wouldn't mean that I would do well at writing what my, my Ed Sheeran did or like what my father did. So specifically with regards to the skill, I didn't pick up anything in terms of writing poetry or romantic songs or mm-hmm. un- unbelievably inspiring songs that he, he wrote. But my whole, what I am today is a lot of it comes to my parents and a lot of it, uh, some of the credit goes to my dad because he used to work from home in the 70s and 80s. So imagine that, right? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, nobody else was doing that at the time. I don't know of, of a single friend's parent, father or mother yeah. who worked from home. So he used to sit at home and he used to write songs and he could do that in anywhere. You, you know, he's waiting at the gas station. He could do that, uh-huh. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wherever, whenever, just give him a piece of paper and a pencil. He didn't need any stylish pad or uh, nothing, no stylish <clears throat> uh, instruments or anything. Just the pen- a paper and a pen or a pencil. Uh, and he, could, he would literally, sometimes he would be going to the studio uh, to record a song the, and he would on the way, he would be in the back of what we used, to, what is called as an auto. I don't know if you heard that. It's auto. It's called auto rickshaw, right? It's yeah. this three wheeler thing that's in India with a seat for the driver in the front and two people in the back. He he would go sit in the back of that. He didn't have a car, you know, in the early days, and he would just sit in the back of an auto going there. It's like a think of it as Uber, right? You're paying, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. getting from one place to another, and you would sit in the back and write the song as he was going to the recording studio where the singer would sing the song. So he had insane concentration. Um, so that I learned, you know, that I need to have that. And I do have that to some extent, because when I'm deep into something, you know, I can't hear my wife calling me or my kids calling me. Um, and I, I do have a little bit of the absent-mindedness that he had, which allows you to focus. You know, if you're constantly aware of everything all the time, you, you cannot focus. Maybe that's a, uh, they, they go hand in hand, I guess. So I have the absent-mindedness and I saw his work ethic and how he was home. He used to work uh, on his own hours. He could spend all day outside and you know not worry about anything and with the family or uh, doing stuff and then he could come home and work in the night nobody else could do that mm-hmm. right so i saw that how he owned his own time and how he controlled it and how he could live the, the life he wanted because he could come to come with me to a movie you know, on a tuesday afternoon at three o'clock no problem right nobody yeah. else could do that and he if he had work to do he could put it off later come back he would spend a few hours in the night or work to like 2 a.m in the morning and finish his, his mm. writing so that's i got the same kind of ideas from that you know i wanted to be an entrepreneur so that i could do the same thing what he did with me so that i could do similarly with my kids you know be, be home uh when they come back from school you know yeah. be able to do different things during the day during the week not worry about having to go to a day job but, you know, it took a lot of sacrifice and a lot of hours at a jo- actual job and getting a green card and citizenship and all that mm-hmm. before I could actually uh, execute that, that dream. Yeah. Um, speaking of owning your time, what time is it over there? It is 2.17 a.m. in San Diego, California. 2.17 a.m. Yeah. Is that a usual time that you're awake? Yeah, I go to bed at 5 o'clock. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and I get up like 12.45 one o'clock in the afternoon that's interesting yeah i love to work in the nights and once um you know in 2010 my wife and i we quit uh, lucrative jobs to move to san diego and first first few days i was still you know waking up at uh, eight o'clock i used uh-huh. to w- wake up at like five o'clock you know to go to catch the train to go to new uh-huh. york city back in new york and so i i'm like i'm not going to get up at five o'clock but then i started getting up at eight that became nine that became ten <laughs> and slowly i started working later and later and later in the nights and that's how i used to be in college too you know over time i i was always a night bird i was the most productive at night and i was the least productive um in the mornings so it gradually became within a few months i had started sleeping at 3 a.m then 4 a.m then i've settled at 5 a.m i don't want to go past it yeah <laughs> go to bed at like six o'clock in the morning so i said okay five is cut off uh-huh. and then I'm, in that for many years now okay that's that's interesting oh going back to your uh your dad a little bit could you share your favorite songs that he wrote uh, for the show notes sure absolutely i'll send you the video too okay perfect on you on youtube um is there any like writing advice that you received maybe from your dad maybe from someone else that you completely disagree with um i see people not, not nobody specific um because it usually if, if i find somebody's advice in in other areas to be too aggressive or too against what my thing is, I stop following them. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I don't I don't follow them long enough to find out what their specific advice is. But generally, I've seen people preaching more perfectionism. You can't just uh, launch a Kindle book just like that. You can't just uh, launch a hundred page ebook. Uh, you have to, you know, have two hundred, two fifty pages at least, and you have to have all. They make up all these rules because they're okay. old school in terms of how they're writing. You have to hire a professional a graphic designer and get, you know, pay a couple thousand dollars, and you, otherwise you will not get a good book cover. Um, and, and you have to hire a professional book editor, and uh, you have to hire a company who will do the typesetting. And so they, there's a lot of people who preach perfectionism, uh-huh. and, and I'm the complete opposite. Yeah, it's almost like you know what's that uh, term? Um, uh, shoot first, aim later, kind of thing, right? Okay. Uh, not maybe not to that extent. And I hate bringing up a violent uh, example for that, but that's the idea, right? Uh, one of my chapters is called "Sell First, Create Later" in my in my uh-huh. book. Yeah. So so. I'm, I'm on the other side. Obviously, I don't, I'm not saying, you know, put out a crappy product. In fact, I even say specifically for podcasters, my advice has always been, if you don't have anything good to say for that week, don't publish an episode just because you, it, you have to publish one every Tuesday at yeah. 10 o'clock, whatever, right? Because that's not how, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio does movies, for the greatest of the great actors. They're not saying I have to put out one movie every year. Sometimes they do one movie every four years, like Tom uh-huh. Hanks or something, right? They're not, they're not, they don't have a schedule for, because putting yourself on a schedule might make you consistent, but it may, it may not make, make the content, epic content. So I, while I'm always erring on the side of publishing quickly uh, without perfectionism, I'm all, I also say that if you don't have anything useful to say, better to wait for some more time before saying it. Don't just uh, publish a crappy book. But if you do have something to say, make it fast, there's so many online tools to write a Kindle book. You know, Google Docs is free. Mm-hmm. Uh, can, you know, Canva is free. Grammarly is free, right? There's so many free th- things and crowdsourcing is is free. You can get mm-hmm. ideas from your audience. You can help get their help in editing your book if you want to, whatever you want, uh, ideas for your book cover. There are Reddit forums that, that can help you. There's insane amount of Facebook groups and Reddit forums and online communities that can help you with whatever you're doing. So just, just keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've got everything you need to write a book yourself. No need to, no need to hire anyone. Exactly. I mean, you you can hire. You know, you should hire somebody if if it's necessary. Spend the money. Don't don't cheapen out. Um, I try to uh, because I wanted to show uh, that that you can write a book fast. I initially had a Canva uh, cover myself, yeah. and I over time I just didn't like it. You know, I said, you know what? I will just let me just get a professional to do mm-hmm. it. And this is an easy way to do it. You know, you can pay fifty to hundred dollars and get a beautiful cover design. So don't skimp out on the cover. If you're a good designer, do it yourself. If not, hire somebody. Pay fifty dollars, hundred dollars. You don't have to pay two thousand dollars. But book book cover is is important because that's the first thing. Especially mm-hmm. if you don't have an audience and you're you're launching on a third party platform, then you definitely need a book cover because they don't know you. Uh, the people there are strangers. But if it's your, my own audience, I launched with my crappy Canva cover and uh-huh. I still got the sales anyway because nobody cares yeah. about the book because they, they know me, right? They're already uh-huh. my existing audience. Like yeah. Gary, Gary V says, you know, he posts an icon like AV, right? Uh-huh. And you got like 17,000 likes on that, right? Yeah. So, so when you have an audience that knows, likes and trusts you, you can do, get away with a lot of uh, nonsense. But once you move to a, a world where there are strangers, they don't know you, uh, like you or trust you, then you have to, uh, present a more professional foot forward and, and yeah. book, professional book cover is going to help with that definitely i found an, another interesting fact about you you said that you're the first indian ever in 1989 that has sold a physical book while living on an online international market so while we were still living in india um can you tell me a little bit about that sure it was not 89 just 97 um when i launched my first book so when I, my wife was pregnant with my, uh, our first daughter, and that's when I, you know, I was looking for baby names and I couldn't find it. So I started a baby name site. And back then I was doing a lot of uh, so-called SEO at the time for yeah. Yahoo, right? There was Yahoo. And then there was the uh, open directory project or something. I forget the name ODP or something like that. And uh, Yahoo used to get some of its listings from them. Yeah. And they say shared editors. So I, used, I did a lot of research. So what I, what I was doing was everything I was learning online from all the original uh, gangsters, uh, OGs of internet marketing back in the day. Um, I was, whatever I was learning online, I was trying it out on my baby name's website, right? Okay. So I used to do the very old version of keyword research. So mm-hmm. there, there used to be Google, and uh, no, not Google, Google was 98, 99, I think. So there was uh, Yahoo, AltaVista, 
uh, ask Jeeves. You probably haven't heard of most of these. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so th those are all the old uh, search engines, right? So I used to go into all these search engines and type in um, all different kinds of keywords, baby names books, uh, Indian books, Indian entrepreneurs selling books. So I researched so much stuff and I did not find a single person that was doing what I was doing. And that's how I claim the title. If somebody wants to come back here now and challenge me, I'll, I'll accept it. Maybe uh -huh. I was not the first, I was the second. Yeah. But for as far as I could, uh, all the research I had done, uh, there's not a single person. Yeah, companies were doing it. That's the thing, right? Uh -huh. um, I'm talking about from as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a solo yes. solopreneur, uh -huh. right? I'm sure there was some company selling you know, their grocery items or something online to, you know, the world over, whatever. As a solopreneur uh, selling digital Network. products, right, a, digital, a single book uh, from uh -huh. a website, from Indian website and shipping it to internationally. Maybe there were people who were doing it locally, but I, I, I doubt it because we didn't even have credit cards back then. Yeah. So it was, it was super hard. It was almost uh -huh. impossible. And the, the reason why I know almost certain, like 99% certain for a fact is that it was practically impossible to find a, an online merchant who would allow you to process payments from outside of India. Uh -huh. And okay. India had India had zero e-commerce at that point. You could not pay. Doesn't matter if you were Indian citizen, you had Indian bank, whatever. You could. There's no way for you to pay another Indian online. So that was out of the question. Now, out of the country, you needed to accept Visa Master, and there was no almost nobody in the world who would take on an Indian merchant back in the day. And I finally found one merchant after talking to probably a hundred different e-commerce uh, banks and credit card processors. Uh -huh. I found one, one company that uh, took, uh, allowed that. They said, okay, we'll do it. But we consider people for, selling from outside the US to be high risk merchants, okay. especially if, if you're in Southeast Asia, you're considered super high risk. Yeah. Uh, and so we're gonna to have to charge a crazy amount per transaction. So for somebody to pay me even one penny, the transaction cost was $10. Oh, wow. So, and uh, the book was like 350 rupees at the time, which amounted to like $5 at the time, five US dollars. But the cost of shipping was like $12. <laughs> mm -hmm. So $12 shipping plus $10 transaction fee, that's $22 and the $5 book and a couple of dollars profit. So I ended up selling like eight point, my book was sold for like $28. Wow. Like, <laughs> for a five five dollar book, it cost me twenty eight dollars with a couple of dollars of profit. Wow. So I knew how hard it was, and there's practically no way anybody else pulled that off other than uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to the last uh, two questions. What is your secret? Well, I have a not very open secret, which is I'm a ventriloquist. So <laughs> <laughs> you might have seen the picture in the beginning of the book. Uh, uh, I've read it with the dolls. With the dolls, yeah. Oh yes, yes, yes secret to writing is typing, learn typing. You know, mm. uh, one thing that nobody tells you, uh, nobody learns officially. When I was growing up, we had all these uh, typing institutes. Yeah. So they would have actual typewriters. Uh, I learned to type on a typewriter. Probably I've typed, you know, for like five years on a typewriter before I ever touched a keyboard because nobody had personal computers back then. Uh -huh. So I can type at 105 words per minute without ever looking at the keyboard. So that is amazing when it comes to, I'm not even saying that to show off, but that is such an incredible superpower to have yeah. when you don't have to look at the keyboard and you're pecking at it with one or two, mm -hmm. three fingers. If you can just look at the camera, uh, not camera, I'm looking at the camera right now, but screen. Look, at the, look at the screen and then you're, you're literally typing as you're thinking what, whatever is coming to your mind. It's probably one step slower than dictating and transcribing, right? So talking obviously is always going to be the fastest way. But I find that when I simply talk, it is hard for me because there's no visual thing of what I what did I just say? What 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 are the things I just covered? But somehow when I see the words on a page, it just flows for me mm -hmm. because I can see what what I talked about in the last paragraph. As I'm typing it, I can correct some basic errors and the words just flow because I'm able to see what I just typed. So it it allows me to format the uh, sentences better. And okay, this paragraph has gotten a little too long. Maybe um, I'll, I'll take into a new paragraph. Now, obviously I'm not necessarily editing it while I'm typing it. <clears throat> uh, I do come back and mm -hmm. do a couple of uh, edits later and it always uh, becomes much smaller by the time I'm done. But just seeing the words will allow me to 
stay on topic. Uh-huh. So learning how to type faster is an interesting Learn- secret or superpower to have. Absolutely, because you know everything is computer based, right? Everything mm-hmm. we're doing is is online, and there is no reason to type with two few fingers and poke on the keyboard and have to look at the keyboard anymore. And yeah. uh, kids start out on computers at just such, a, such a young age, and all the classes are online. There's no more writing. When you're going to do something for the rest of your life, and it is going to determine how productive you are, it's a it'll be a crime to not learn typing. Yeah. So many good, good websites online. If you just type typing tutorials, you'll find a bunch of good ones. All right. Um, so let's take it offline for the last question for one thing that does matter when it comes to writing. What is your favorite coffee? It's, it has to be dark roast. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and in California, we have this uh, coffee chain called Coffee Bean. Okay. Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf. Um, so that's my, my favorite coffee. And recently I've started with a new, I forget the name, um, because the coffee machine broke and I, I tried to order through coffee bean, bean so many times. They never sent me the machine. I had to get a bunch of refunds. So I switched and now I have a new type of coffee uh, machine. And I also discovered a new trick is to order chicory powder. You know uh-huh. chicory, right? Yeah. So or, keep chicory powder separately, order it and, and add a couple of teaspoons of chicory powder. It makes it super strong, dark roast, maximum you know, mm-hmm. like nine out of 10 dark. And uh, of course I, I add a half and half and um, add a couple of uh, spoons of uh, chicory powder. Yeah. It tastes exactly like South Indian coffee, which I grew up loving. Uh-huh. So that's my favorite. Yeah. Here in um, in Belgium, I think people uh, drank this um, chicory powder before when they couldn't afford coffee. Well, now it's of course a lot more affordable. Yeah, so chicory powder adds a slight bitterness slash uh-huh. sweet sweetness to the to the coffee and yeah. gives like a richer body. And for me, even the dark roast is not dark enough, uh, it's strong enough. So I need to add that and make it a little more stronger, add some half and half, yeah. uh, and then it's perfect. And it's perfect. Okay, <laughs> just a final question. So you mentioned that you, you could send a, a copy of Russia with Kindle. I was wondering, do you think it would be possible to share a copy with the readers? And- Absolutely. Sure. Actually, I do have it. Mm-hmm. If you go to one day, one time.com. Uh-huh. You can sign up for free. Okay. One day, one time.com. And people can get a free copy of Crush It with Kindle right there. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So um, thank you, Ravi. It was a very interesting interview. And uh, before we go, where can people find out more about you? Where should they follow you? Sure. Uh, my website is subscribeme.fm. And that happens to be the name of my podcast as well. So if you're, if you're an avid podcast listener on whatever podcast app, you can just search for subscribeme.fm as one word. You'll find it. And on the website, you can find my, my podcast player, my books, my coaching details about me. You can email me, Ravi, R-A-V as in Victor, I at subscribeme.fm. If you have any questions, uh, suggestions, feedback for me and, uh, like you said, you, you can go to one day, one time.com and uh, my crush it with Kindle uh, ebook for free as a PDF. Uh, and I hope that I brought value to your listeners and shared uh, something useful that they can take away from this conversation. Okay. I'm sure you did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kiel. I appreciate it.